we're, all, okay, we're joined by, and then good. we'll start into it. I'll try and be as chronological as possible, starting with good. your childhood, and then just good. take it all the way through. Mm -hmm. We all set? Yeah. We're joined today by Senator John McCain, Republican of Arizona. Senator, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Rush. Senator, let me ask you, you were born into a military family, a family of warriors, really. Um, tell us a little bit about your father, your grandfather. My family goes back to our Revolutionary War, where my great-great-great-grandfather was uh, uh, captain on General Washington's staff. Uh, serving in the military was a tradition in, in my family, and my grandfather was a graduate of the Naval Academy in 1906, my father in 1931, and I graduated in 1958. I had several uncles who graduated from West Point. I'm embarrassed to tell you. <laughs> and uh, so uh, my grandfather was an aviator. Uh, he and uh, then Captain Halsey, at a very advanced age, went down to Pensacola to get their pilot training because the Navy had passed a rule that you couldn't command an aircraft carrier unless you were an aviator. So a group of old captains went down, crashed a few airplanes, and became became aviators. My first, my grandfather's first assignment was to be commander of the Ranger, which was one of our early aircraft carriers. So you really had no, no choice in the matter. It was almost genetic what your destiny would be. I think so, um, and that's not all good, you know, because it increased my uh, rebelliousness, which I'm sure was already there anyway. Um, I think we should. Uh, give our children uh, more freedom to choose, perhaps, than, than I had, being a child of the 50s. Did you know your grandfather well at all? I did not know my grandfather real well. He died right at the end of World War II. It's kind of an interesting story. He was uh, commander of the carrier task forces under Admiral Halsey at the end of the war, and he was at Tokyo Bay on the signing, uh, peace signing on the Missouri. If you look at the famous picture of MacArthur and Hall <coughs> Nimitz uh, and Halsey, he's in the front row in that famous picture. And he flew home the next day and uh, took about three days to get home in those days. And the air transportation they had, he arrived home. My grandmother lived in their house in Coronado. And the day he got home, they had a big party. You know, it was a, quite a time, a victory in World War II. In the middle of the cocktail party, he had a heart attack and died. So I remember him. I remember that he used to roll his own cigarettes with Bull Durham tobacco. And I remember that he was um, very affectionate. But other than that, I don't have a lot of memories of him. Were you close to your father? I was close to my father, except for the fact that he was gone so much. Uh, all during World War II, he was gone. He was a commander of a submarine in, in the Pacific. Um, he was gone during the Korean War. And then at other times in my life, he was gone at sea as, because naval duties carry people to sea. So I didn't see him as much as perhaps uh, would have allowed us to get real close. I was, had great affection and respect and admiration. What sort of father was he when he was around? He was very affectionate, very steeped in this naval tradition. He loved the Navy. He loved. Uh, everything about it. He loved going to sea in ships. Um, and he had a total commitment and dedication to the Navy. And I think deep down, uh, his family came second uh, because of his devotion to the Navy. But he was a very wonderful father. And we spent a lot of time together when he was, when he was at home. Uh, and, and we got along very well. The fact that the family came second did that lead to rebelliousness on your part as a, as a young man? Did you feel second best or any of that sort of psychological? I don't think so. I think the fact that my future was mapped out for me from the time I could talk <laughs> uh, was probably what started it. You know, the, I went to a boys boarding school and the other guys I graduated with went to Ivy League schools or Southern schools and uh, I guess I you know, I didn't, it's not that I didn't want to go to the Naval Academy. I just uh, probably wished I'd had, if I'd had the choice, I'm sure I would have chosen the Naval Academy. I just resented probably not having the choice. Is there anything you think that you might have rather have done than the military growing up? Mm, no, because I've always 
I've always had that love of the military as well. Um, so I, I really never contemplated another life. I certainly didn't contemplate a political life. How did you uh, choose naval aviation? Frankly, the glamour, <laughs> the glamour of naval aviation. I used to see these guys with their new cars and their and girls on their arms and the, and the lifestyle. Uh, and I also thought that flying airplanes in combat was probably the ultimate experience that anybody could have. When you started doing it, did it live up to your expectations? Oh, yes. Yes, in the Vietnam War, I was, uh, we're jumping ahead, but uh, the, the air wing that I was in, uh, it was very dangerous business in those days. What, for those of us who haven't done it and will never do it, describe what it's like being in aerial combat. You flew 22 missions. Mm -hmm. What is it like? Well, I think that friends of mine who flew hundreds of missions uh, probably are much more qualified to describe the experience, but it's, a, it's an environment of intense um, uh, attention focusing. There's certain fear, but that fear is, is a controlled fear, and it's a healthy fear. But there's also the uh, focusing of the mind, your attentions, your reflexes uh, in a situation that obviously your, your life is in danger. But it's also a certain amount of excitement, you know, the excitement of the hitting the target or dodging the missile or uh, that kind of thing is also, um, it's, it's a very exciting and very adrenaline inducing experience and one that lived up to every expectation that I had of flying in combat. Most and, I, and I'd like to mention one other aspect of this. People talk about the effect of the war and whether it was right or wrong in the anti-war movement and all that. I was a professional naval aviator. I was out to do the job that I was told to do and trained to do. And when I was shot down in 1967, there was not the anti-war movement or the sentiment either within or without from the military. So I never had any doubts about that I was doing what I was trained to do and what the commander in chief expected and my country expected me to do. No moral compunction? No, because the, the, they, were, they were shooting down my friends. I mean, it was, a, it was combat. And uh, uh, what we were doing was hitting military targets. In fact, in the view of most of, of, of us, it was way too restrictive. I mean, we were assigned specific targets. And so, uh, no, there was, there was not only not moral compunction, we had the belief that if we destroyed the targets we were assigned and did it efficiently, then we wouldn't have to go back and either put ourselves or our comrades in danger. For those of you who were on the front lines, so mm -hmm. to speak, was the war run poorly? Was it a poorly thought out strategy? Was it implemented incorrectly? What went wrong mm -hmm. with Vietnam? Well, you know, it's a subject that we could dwell on for a long time. But from the pilot's point of view, it was frustrating. It was frustrating because we were not allowed to go all out. Never forget the first target I had was a barracks that had already been bombed many times. A hundred yards or so from the barracks was a bridge, which trucks went over. Now, I could go bomb the barracks again, but I could not bomb that bridge, which was carrying supplies to the south. Uh, the policy that we could not take out the missiles when they were unloaded at Haiphong, watch them being trucked up, put in place, and then shot at us. Then we could, could respond. I mean, some of it was just foolishness. And so we were frustrated by those constraints. And um, you know, I'll never forget one time one of our pilots was shot down in Haiphong. Another pilot bombed where he thought the, the uh, anti-aircraft fire came from. And because we weren't supposed to bomb inside of, Haif inside of Haifang, he was in trouble. Well, that's not, that's not right. <clears throat> so we were frustrated by that. And we all know now that these targets were selected in the basement of the Oval Office. Are you OK, Nancy? Are you guys OK? Or, is that or do you want me to? OK. Thank you. Thank you. I know too a little bit about the uh, bridge again on that last flight. Okay. 
Yeah, if you don't mind. What's that? If you, the, the sound bite about the uh, the bridge not being mm -hmm. able to bomb mm -hmm. the bridge. Mm -hmm. God. It must have been frustrating as hell. It's basically like you weren't allowed to act in self-defense then. Mm -hmm. It was bizarre. And, um, you know, when we heard that that pilot had, was in trouble for having bombed the anti-aircraft site with an iPhone, I mean, you know, they did they recognize that they shouldn't, but I mean, it was crazy. Okay, Nancy? Yeah. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> I mean, I remember very clearly the one of the targets I was assigned was a barracks uh, that had been bombed on numerous occasions before. 100 yards away was a bridge that trucks carrying supplies to the south uh, went over, but we were forbidden from striking that target. We all know that the war was micromanaged uh, to the degree where there was enormous restraint placed on the pilots until the Christmas bombing of 1972, Christmas of 72. And when that took place, that really brought the Vietnamese to their knees. That proved the efficacy of air power when the B-52s came over Hanoi in 50, uh, summer of 70, uh, Christmas of 72, and the Vietnamese defenses were virtually wiped out. So now let's go back a little bit to the Forrestal incident. Mm -hmm. If you could describe mm -hmm. what happened, how you felt. Well, we were in the Gulf of Tonkin in July of 1967. <clears throat> Our air wing had trained for a year before coming online, and we were very highly trained and I think very capable. And we'd only been on the line for a few days. Uh, we were launching one of our first major strikes. About 30 airplanes were all going in to strike a target in uh, around Haiphong, as I remember. And uh, the uh, planes are lined up along the edges of the flight deck, and then a group of planes are in the back of the flight deck when you're getting ready to launch. The um, planes that are on the edge of the flight deck are parked at an angle, and my plane was on the port side or the left side of the ship. and. Um, at, at an angle, and across from me was a group of F-4s. The F-4 Phantoms were carrying Zuni rockets, which is a very large rocket. By a terrible error, the, which I won't go into detail, the, the Zuni rocket was fired from the wing of an F-4, came across the flight deck, and went through the 300-gallon fuel tank underneath my airplane, punched through it. Uh, the fuel spilled out on fire, and spread all around the flight deck. And some bombs that were on my, the wing of my airplane were knocked off onto the flight deck. After a very brief period of time, uh, those bombs started exploding. I had shut down the airplane and jumped off the refueling probe of, uh, of my airplane, which stands very high on deck, and rolled through the fire. Had lots of clothing on when you go into combat. and. Um, I ran over the other side of the flight deck, and I saw another pilot in the plane next to mine try to get out of his airplane, and he was in the fire. And I just started to come over across the flight deck when the first bomb went off, and it blew holes in the flight deck, and then it turned into a real conflagration. The crew of the, of the Forrestal fought that fire with uh, some of the greatest examples of heroism, sacrifice, I think, we've ever seen in the history of the Navy. And they saved the ship. There were a couple of occasions where the captain was actually thinking about abandoning ship because these bombs blew holes in the flight deck as well, and burning fuel went down into the next level where the hangar, called the hangar bay, <clears throat> where other ship airplanes are parked. So they, they were able to control the fire after about 12 hours took about 24 hours to put it out. And 344, I mean 134 young men died in uh, fighting that fire. It's still the single greatest disaster uh, that has been experienced uh, in a Navy aircraft carrier. We had other fires, but this was, this was the greatest. And I had gotten some shrapnel, but nothing of any particular import. And um, so 
the ship was in a, unable to continue in combat and went back to the Philippines and then back to the United States. I transferred on to a, uh, uh, onto the USS Oriskany. Uh, one story that's kind of worth relating, after I had been injured, I went up to, uh, after a few hours, I went up to the sick bay area and um, to get some bandages. And, and I walked in and there was a lot of young men laying there who were very badly burned. And, and I heard one of them call to me and I went over and he was one of our plane captains and he was terribly burned. And he asked about one of the pilots and I said, well, he was fine. And he made it through and he said, who was the pilot of the plane that he was the plane captain of? And I said, he's fine. He said, thank God, and died right there. And um, it was really quite moving to see how these young men had been so terribly burned uh, and literally threw themselves into the fire to save the ship. You ever think back, I mean, is there a day that goes by when you don't think back of what happened there and the heroism and, and the loss of lives and the loss of your friends? Well, I think about it uh, frequently, uh, particularly uh, because they were such brave people, average age around 19. Um, and I, but, I, but I think of them in a mixture of sorrow for their passing, but also for pride and great pride in what they did for the country and their shipmates. By sacrificing their lives, they saved perhaps maybe hundreds more. So I understand that you did not have to transfer. You could have gone back home, but you chose to transfer. Yep. Why? Not very smart, I guess. I, I wanted to stay in combat. That's what I'd been trained to do. That was, I was a professional naval aviator. I wanted to do it. So it's not, uh, it's not that unusual. And so when they came over to our ship in the Philippines and said they were looking for people to go over to the Oriskany, A4 pilots, because they were losing a lot of pilots, I, I volunteered to do that. Somebody might think that, you know, you're, if you're playing amateur psychologist, that you're trying to win the approval of a father or a grandfather. Is there any sort of that element in there at all, do you think, or are you just mm -hmm. trying to do your job? Well, I always obviously sought their approval. I think that's natural. But the real motivation that I think I felt that day when I volunteered to go there at Riskany was, look, this is, this is the business I trained for. I was 31 years old at the time. I had been an avi naval aviator since I was 21. I was, that was my business. And um, I also understood uh, from the way that the speech was delivered by the guy that came over that they really did need pilots. I mean, it was a need, and I felt that it's something that I could do. Then you flew about two dozen missions before mm -hmm. you got shot down. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened when you got shot down. Well, we were launching major strikes. That was one of the height of the escalation of the war, the fall of 1967. And the weather was pretty good, and so we launched a lot of of strikes. Um, it was a major strike on, for the first time, on a target downtown Hanoi, the thermal power plant in Hanoi. And there was about 26 airplanes, uh, and um, we took off and rendezvoused, and then uh, we came in south of Hanoi and then turned and came back in so that when we pulled off the target, we'd be headed back towards the the Gulf of Tonkin. At that time, Hanoi was defended by three concentric rings of surfaced air missile, including and a lot of anti-aircraft obvi uh, equipment, obviously uh, guns. So we came back in. I my target was the thermal power plant. We clearly identified it. It sat next to a lake. It was pretty easy to spot, and. Um, we started taking a lot of fire, and uh, I rolled in on the target. And as I, um, as I did, uh, 
well, starting when we were well away from Hanoi, we started taking a lot of surface-to-air missiles. It's fairly easy to avoid uh, one surface-to-air missile, or even two, you can do it. But when you've got seven, eight, ten in the air at once, it gets a little more interesting. And uh, we had equipment, electronic countermeasure equipment, that would indicate when a surface-to-air missile was tracking on us. And, and uh, so when I rolled in, I had indications that I was being tracked, but I saw a lot of missiles. So I continued with the run, um, released my bombs, and just as I released them, a surface-to-air missile hit the wing of my airplane, took it off, and the airplane <clears throat> began a very deep, steep dive, um, spiraling. I ejected from my airplane and hit um, my arm and my leg when I went out because the airplane was gyrating, breaking my shoulder and, uh, and my, excuse me, my arm and my knee. I landed in a lake right near the center of the city of Hanoi called the Western Lake. A uh, large number of people pulled me out of the lake after having some difficulty inflating my life vest because my arm's being broken. And uh, they dragged me up on the shore. Um, they began beating me and bayoneted my foot in, in, in my groin and uh, smashed my shoulder with a rifle butt. And um, then photographers came up, and a woman came up and gave me a cup of tea. And they took pictures of that, which I just thought was very moving. And uh, then they threw me in the back of a, of a truck and took me to the Hanoi Hilton, as we know of it, the old French prison that's in the center of the city of Hanoi. Did you think you were going to die at that point? I think when you're in a situation like that, you don't wonder whether you're going to live or die. You, you, you sort of try to hang on. I don't, I'm not sure you ask yourself that question that when a lot of things are happening all at once, or I didn't. How long did it take them to realize that they really had a, a prize? About three or four days. Um, they kept me on a stretcher on the floor of a cell, and uh, they would interrogate me every few hours, but I was in such bad shape that I would just pass out. And, but they said that they didn't give any medical treatment until you gave them information. And um, one day, uh, I think it was about the third or fourth day, a guard came in, they pulled a blanket off me, and I saw my knee was very badly swollen and discolored, and I knew that I was in shock. And so I asked them to take me to the hospital, and, and uh, they called in uh, their doctor, and he said it was too late. And uh, so that concerned me a little bit. And then a few hours later, the cell opened, and the interrogator, a guy we knew of called the Bug, came in and said, uh, your father is a big admiral, and we're going to take you to the hospital. Uh, so it re really saved my life, the fact they found out who my father was. Took me to the hospital, cut open my leg, put a chest cast on to one of my arms, and. Uh, and I think probably saved my life because they gave me some transfusions. Before they did that, how tempted were you to give them the information that they wanted to know? Mm. You're always tempted, but uh, you know, I didn't, didn't wasn't going to do it. You know. So you would have died. Well, you don't believe that you're going to die. You know, I mean, I wasn't in wasn't something where I could feel myself dying. I mean, you know, so I, I, again, I don't think I, I knew that I was in bad shape from looking up my knee, but uh, again, I didn't think that I was, I was dying. Although, according to them, I was. What was life such as it is like in the Hanoi Hilton? It was long days of boredom and solitude, in my case, years of solitary confinement, interspersed with uh, times of great stress and, uh, and uh, duress. Did you ever feel, especially when you were in solitary confinement, that you had been abandoned anyhow? No, I never did. But there was a period where all of us were depressed, and that was when Lyndon Johnson 
stopped the bombing in October of 1968 and they started the peace talks. All of us felt with justification that it wouldn't be long before we'd be going home. I mean, they stopped the bombing, peace talks started. And after some months, it became painfully apparent that um, we might be there a long time. And I think all of us were depressed for a period of time, and that's when I told myself I'd never get excited until I, again, until I saw an American in uniform. It's too hard on you when you have your hopes up and, and then, they're, then they're dashed as they were. How do you keep the other guy's spirits up? Communications. Communications are the most important thing, tapping on the walls and keeping in contact. It really is the key to it. Because as long as you feel that we're all in it together, then you can survive and resist. That's why the Vietnamese kept us in those conditions for so long, in solitary confinement or two or three to a room, is so that they could wear people down. Um, and in many ways, it's effective. Were you aware of what was going on in the outside world at all? Every room had a loudspeaker in it, uh, and they would play this program called Hanoi Hanna, which was supposed to be to the troops in the South. Now, I never met a soldier that served in the South that heard it, but we used to hear it in the morning and in the evening. They would give us selected information. If it was bad news, like the assassination of Bobby Kennedy or Martin Luther King, they'd tell us. They would neglect to tell us minor events such as the moon landing. Uh, but if it was bad news, they would, they would give us that. So, but it was, I thought it was kind of entertaining, really. I used to enjoy listening to it because it was such malarkey. Did you hear about Jane Fonda's visit to? Oh, yes. What was your feeling about that? Well, they wanted me to meet with uh, Ms. Fonda, and I wouldn't do that. Um, the only thing I resented about Ms. Fonda's behavior was when she sat in an anti-aircraft gun emplacement and said something like she wished that she could also shoot down an air pirate or something like that. We, we thought that was over the line. But frankly, it didn't bother us as much as you might think. I mean, after all, she's a movie actress. And so, and these things fade from your memory over time. I did an interview with Everett Alvarez several years ago. Seems to have absolutely no bitterness. You seem in many ways to have absolutely no bitterness. How do you make that, that conscious decision to go on with your life, to be affirmative in your life, and not to be bitter? First of all, when you're in that prison situation that I was in, when I'd start feeling sorry for myself, I would think of Everett Alvarez, who'd been there some two and a half or three years before I was. So, uh, I, uh, Everett was a, was a source of inspiration to all of us, Everett Alvarez was. Oh, I, th I think you, look, um, you're grateful for the opportunity to live in a country like America. You're grateful to have an opportunity to, to continue with your life. You're grateful to have had the privilege of serving in the company of heroes. Uh, that's the great privilege of my life. I observed a thousand examples of courage and compassion and love, and uh, that was a great experience for me. It did take its toll, though, like many prisoner of war, prisoners mm -hmm. of wars, your mm -hmm. marriage dissolved mm -hmm. afterwards. What is the impact? How can you go back to a normal, normal life or normal day-to-day -day existence? Well, it took me about 45 minutes to, to put the prison experience behind me. I mean, I, I have fond memories of those I served with and the wonderful friendships I had. The rest of it, I just put behind me, and I think that that's what almost all of us did. Uh, because we had a unique bond that existed between us that will always be there. I, uh, my, my friends are still those I had the privilege of, of serving with. So, you know, it's, it's not that hard to, to put it behind you and you've got to move on with your life and do the best you can. Now, this is the definition of a loaded question. When mm -hmm. you look around at your Senate colleagues mm -hmm. and you think back to the men that were in the mm -hmm. Hanoi Hilton with you, you ever see a real dichotomy there in terms of character or quality? No, because, you know, people 
most of the time, heroes rise to the occasion. People who might be ordinary people uh, are heroes when the situation calls for it. Audie Murphy was a very common young man who was one of our great heroes. So it's hard to know how people will react uh, in a situation of great pressure and stress. What was the reaction of the general public when you came home? Vietnam veterans in general were not warmly mm -hmm. received. Mm -hmm. Well, the thing that I think a lot of us always felt guilty about was that we were welcomed home as heroes and the other Vietnam veterans were not. I will always feel guilty for it. It was one of the reasons why I dedicated so much of my efforts to healing the wounds of the Vietnam War. So uh, it wasn't uh, a fair, to be honest with you. But what was wonderful was after the Persian Gulf War, when they welcomed home all of our Persian Gulf War heroes, they included the Vietnam veterans in those homecoming celebrations. And one of the great experiences of my life was marching with other Vietnam veterans in a parade with our Persian Gulf War veterans. And many of those Vietnam veterans who were marching, it's the first time that they'd ever been thanked. It was a very emotional time for all of us. Do you think some of your success last year when you ran for president was due to baby boomers kind of reevaluating the role of the Vietnam War? No, I think what probably helped our campaign was the call to, to serving the country, a cause greater than one's self-interest. And I think that particularly resonated with younger Americans post-baby boomers uh, than anybody else. Plus, it obviously evoked patriotism in all Americans. But I think the most significant effect was on young Americans. Bottom line, when it comes right down to it, does John McCain want to be remembered as an aviator, or a prisoner of war, or a politician? How do you want to be remembered? Well, I think I'd like to be remembered as a, not a very good aviator, uh, a fair politician, although a loser, uh, and perhaps, most of all, for a guy who loved his country. Senator, thank you very much. Thank for you. Being with us.